<laughs> okay, so I hope this will be a relevant contribution to the working group. So please interrupt me in case there is anything uh, anything um, unclear. Uh, so uh, as I said, I, I sort of pick up some uh, some questions in the in the morning session yesterday. So I gave I gave us some material about uh, fluctuations because I understood this was this was a main issue. So this is absolutely not new material, and it's not even my. Uh, own contribution, but something I've been very interested in. So I, I sort of followed and tried to, to recap a few things. So you, you might know already about that. And it's not um, exactly about the, the per replica uh, fluctuations or variations, but it might be uh, it might be um, rated in any, any sense. So I hope it will not be uh, completely irrelevant. The point is that in this kind of um, uh, invasion, there is actually large fluctuations at the edge of the front, which is very well known and described. And as far as I know, there is not much done in uh, in uh, in uh, in, uh, in front propagation with uh, with dispersal evolution. So this might be an open question. So for that, I have no answer. And the second point is about uh, spatial sorting and uh, and dispersal evolution with PDE. So without any uh, stochastic uh, effects. And there, I will I will bring uh, some uh, some. Um, some uh, some of my uh, own contribution and some of us we try to uh, to answer some of the question that uh, that I heard uh, Fritsch of uh, uh, pointed uh, yesterday. So the, the first is about the Fisher KPP equation and, and I just to 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 uh, to recap a few uh, few things which are essentially by, by these two people uh, Eric Brunet and Bernard Derrida and some other theoretical physicists. And they made uh, some conjectures in the early uh, 2000 about the fluctuations of uh, this equation. So the, the main, uh, the main, uh, the main contribution is known uh, was known as the Brunet Derrida conjecture and was solved uh, in 2010 by a free uh, mathematician. One is actually in Toronto, uh, Jeremy Castel. And uh, to, to, to introduce this uh, notion of uh, large fluctuations, I'd like to do three things. First, recap very quickly uh, how to compute the minimal speed for this equation, so where you have only diffusion and, uh, and reproduction with uh, coefficient diffusion D and rate of reproduction R with a spatial only population density. It's important for the following. It's only in space uh, that you are describing uh, your population. And uh, then I will introduce a stochastic correction of the speed, which is known as the Brunet Derrida conjecture. And I'll try to explain where does this uh, come from. And then I will, I will uh, use that, sort of uh, motivate and introduce uh, the, the fluctuation for the, for the position of the front, which are, which are, uh, which are quite large. Uh, and then I would be very interested in any discussion about that. So how, how to compute the minimal speed? So as you uh, all know, so you have a you, you have a density rho t and x, and you try to you linearize a problem. And because it's a linear equation, you are looking for exponential solution. And the natural candidate is something which is uh, spatially decaying with some rate lambda. So it's a spatial decay in space x, and then which is moving at some uh, speed c. And if you plug this particular on that in your uh, linear equation without the competition, then you get that C uh, lambda times C is actually, so this is due to the time derivative. Then you have the spatial derivative, the diffusion, which is which scales as a lambda squared plus uh, the, 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 the growth term. So it gives you a formula for C if you see it as a function of lambda, which is D lambda plus R over lambda. And as you know, if you plot this C over lambda as a function of lambda, then you get something which decreases for small lambda and then increases for large lambda. And there is a, a minimal point E and a minimal value C uh, star, which is a minimal speed. And in this case, it's just as Fritschhoff, uh, Fritschhoff sorry, mentioned yesterday, it's two uh, and the harmonic uh, geometric, geometrical mean between R and D. Okay, so this is, uh, and what is important to keep in mind is this formula for C. This is something that will play a role because uh, there is something occurring near uh, this minimal point here that will, uh, that will be a part of the, of the next, uh, of the next uh, slide. So what happens now if you have uh, only a finite uh, population? So of course, because it's, in it's expanding at the end, it becomes very large, but here, finite population means that you have some sort of carrying capacity of size n, which is a number of individuals you can uh, you can uh, allow in your environment. And what you are looking at in the PDE is uh, the, the number, the counting, and dividing by the, the typical size, which is carrying capacity. 
Okay, so this is a typical density. And when n is very large, then of course you have the Fisher KPP equation, which is a standard uh, thing. But now, if uh, you have finite n, you expect, of course, at the edge uh, to have only a very few individuals uh, at the edge of the front. And this uh, might, of course, be far from your large population limit. That is a PD. So to, uh, to resolve this issue, uh, Brunet and Derrida introduced the following uh, correction. So it's a uh, Brunet Derrida. Uh, correction. So it was a conjecture. And it says that C as a function of N now, the so minimal speed, it's, uh, it's all about the minimal speed, is your uh, true minimal speed minus something. The fact that you have only a finite number of, of people uh, is, uh, is, uh, is something which plays against uh, range expansion. And this is some constant K divided by the logarithm of the population size to the square. So when n is large, like a power of 10, uh, this log of n is not that large. It means that this might be a, reason, a quite large uh, correction. And, uh, and this is due essentially to the fact that you have only a finite uh, number. So it means that in terms of uh, effective population size, what you see here is not the population of size n, but rather population of size log n, if you, if you look at that. And this constant, this constant k is not that important, but just to keep it, just to have it in mind, it's a p square divided by two, and then you have something which is depends on your on your problem, which is lambda star, so your your rate of of, of decay times the value of uh, the similar relative of C uh, at the minimal point. So as I said, it's something which is around uh, the minimal point. So if anyone is interested in, is interested in that, I'm, I, I've prepared some, uh, some material to, to, to actually to not, not to prove it because it's, uh, as I say, it was proven uh, 10 years ago um, by, uh, by, uh, by a free mathematics free probability. So I, I'm not able to, uh, to read this proof, but I, 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 um, I, I, I looked at this uh, Brunet Derrida uh, conjecture and the way they, they do that is, uh, is rather, let's say intuitive. So if, if anyone is interested, I can go into the details of this formula in particular, why this log of n squared arises here. Okay, but this is only if there is some, uh, some interest. Uh, and uh, what uh, was important to me to, 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 get, uh, to, 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 to show you is now, which is truly a conjecture, uh, to my knowledge, it hasn't, hasn't been proven yet, but it's, it's, there are a lot of evidence which is the fluctuations of the front position. So you know that if you have only a finite number of individuals, the, 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 the speed will be, uh, will be impacted by a log n squared. And now uh, using the same kind of tools, and this is a collaboration between Brunet, Derrida, Muller, and Meunier, uh, they say that the, 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 the location of the front will uh, wander around. So it will, it will, it will, it will increase if you, if you, if you plot uh, x, as a function of t, it will it will sort of uh, wander around with some with some speed, and it will have some, some some diffusion, and the diffusion is exactly given by this value. So it's the same lambda star c uh, second lambda star. So you can see that it comes from the same kind of arguments. But now you have a log n over cube, which again can be pretty large for let's say uh, mild uh, population sizes. So okay. So what I wanted to point out is that it is expected that even with a simpler possible model, you have a uh, large diffusion. And what is interesting to me in this kind of uh, analysis is that this is universal. The P, of course, the pi, uh, the log n are universal, but this part depends on your, on your model. It depends on how the, the minimal speed uh, is a function of, uh, how the speed is a function of lambda in your, uh, in the so-called dispersion relation, which is uh, the relation between uh, the, the exponential uh, spatial decay and, uh, and the speed, the actual speed that you have to minimize. It's kind of, uh, of, of, of a function. And uh, this, is, uh, this, is, uh, this is model dependent. So depending on your model, and I think it was a question which was raised uh, yesterday, depending on the model or the mechanisms, uh, you may expect uh, different sort of uh, fluctuations or variations. And this formula tells you that it is actually uh, model dependent. So if you, if you have a model that gives you uh, the function C, 
but you have to minimize. You can minimize it. Look into this formula and look what kind of what is the prediction of this uh, of this fluctuation. But uh, as I as I told you, up to my knowledge, this has been mainly done for the for the for the Fisher KPP equation or uh, let's say um, equations in this uh, in this uh, in this class. Okay, so uh, are there any questions about this uh, first um, this first uh, part? Hi, Vincent. Yeah, we've got one question here. Uh, hi, Vincent. Um, I, I was just wondering, so you're assuming that there is this exponential decay at the front, right? It only works for modifications of models that have that property. Yes, you, you have to be in the what they call the university uh, universality class of uh, Fisher KPP, Fisher KPP, which essentially tells you that. Uh, in fact, there is some some subtlety here, but I didn't want to uh, to enter into the detail. Is that uh, you must be decaying like uh, there should be uh, some uh, some x here uh, due to the fact that uh, asymptotically you're not not exactly exponential. There is some some linear uh, correction. But apart from that, yes, it's uh, it's for uh, for uh, for something which has to do with the linear decay at infinity. Thank you. But I, I'm not sure you. Do. What did you have in mind? Did you have some? Uh... Well, pushed waves, no, right? Yeah. Okay. okay. So so this is this is for pulled waves, uh, where you have a, a loss of a genetic diversity at the at the front. Uh, for for push twelve, this is expected to be of the size of one over n, if I'm not mistaken. Something which is which becomes really small when n is a, is a, is reasonably large. I have a question. Um, so, is the n here the total population size over the entire spatial domain? No, this is seen as a carrying capacity. This is the thing you should divide your counting uh, uh, quantity to get something of order one. Okay, so and, like if so you have a uniform density of order one, you have uh, you have n individuals per unit size. Okay, so it's the stable population size. Yes. Yes. Um, okay. Thanks. Okay, and just maybe one thing to, to, to make this because this might be the, 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 the real point in the, in the conjecture is that when you are looking at uh, when you are, you, are, you, are, you, are, you are doing this renormalization by the carrying capacity to get a density of order one in the, in the, at, the, at the back of the wave, you are actually dividing by, uh, by capital N your counting uh, measure. So it means that when you have one individual isolated here, it corresponds in some sense to a density here of order one over n. You see, if there's only one individual, it means that rho is of one, one, of, uh, one over n. So what is done in the conjecture is to, is to identify a point here, which is to say some kind of typical size ahead of the front, where your density minus lambda uh, L of n is of order one over n. So the, the, it's, if it's a two or three or 10, it doesn't really matter. It's something which is of order one over n, which is somehow to, to see at which, dense, at which value your density is so small that you cannot even guarantee that, that, that there is one individual. So you, you, this identify you a typical size. And this is where you see the log because the typical size now is the log of n divided by uh, lambda, your, uh, your rate of decay. And now the, the conjecture is to say that you can relate the, the speed to this uh, L of n. And this is where the log of n arrives. So the, it really uh, amounts to, to identify at which points your density is not a good approximation for your population because you are really, the population is too scarce. And this very rough argument, which is to uh, identify this number here, is enough to, uh, to get the conjecture. Okay, uh, so if there is no more question, I will move to my second point, which is uh, how, let's say, how I see a very uh, loosely uh, special sorting in, in PD models. So a way to see it, uh, as uh, Fritjof mentioned yesterday, is to describe your population with a trait uh, very naturally, and I will uh, take uh, directly a continuous one. So D now is a new variable in my identity. So my population density is not only in space, time and space, but also um, uh, it's also uh, related to uh, re respective to the, to the let's say uh, some sort of dispersal ability, which for simplicity will be only diffusion. 
yeah. I will uh, I will uh, resume uh, all this personality in a diffusion coefficient. So no kernel, no no, no uh, particular shape. I just say that diffusion is a, is a, is a, is a proxy for this personality. So now D is a variable in my density. So it type that I have a, a description of my population depending on how uh, where they are and how disper uh, dispersal uh, how dispersive they, they are. So uh, a very natural extension of the Fisher KPP, which, which are not uh, due to our, our, our contribution, which was known before, just introduced before, is the following. So of course we have diffusion with question D here, very natural, by definition, this is a diffusion in space. Then you, are, you, have, you have reproduction, so we see diffusion. Then you have reproduction. And in the reproduction process, you assume that there is some small variations in the dispersionability at each reproduction event. So with rate R, you have a new individual. So it will be very uh, close to the parent. So F here is unchanged, plus some small deviation in the diffusion variable. So here we assume that diffusion, the, the diffusion itself, so dispersionability might be different, slightly different with some, uh, some uh, um, a standard deviation sigma from the parent. And if you do that, this is to say that there is some kind of diffusion in the diffusion coefficient itself, which is a bit uh, weird, but it's the way we, uh, we, we did that. And then you have, uh, you have competition. And competition is through all population at the same location X that you sum up in all uh, dispersal abilities. So uh, they are all, uh, all dispersers compared for the same resource uh, locally in space. Okay, so uh, here's a, a question. If there is only one D, then you recover exactly KPP. Uh, this term doesn't really matter. So you get exactly diffusion, uh, reproduction, and competition. So it's exactly KPP, Fisher KPP. But now you have this uh, slight variations in the phenotype. So this is what I said. Uh, if uh, you are in a bonded uh, trade domain, so if you have a minimal possible diffusion, dispersal ability and the maximal one, you will uh, put, uh, let's say, zero flux boundary condition to say that there is no influx uh, because just you want to, uh, this process to be conservative. And, uh, but you may have uh, uh, the maximal uh, dispersal ability, which is unbounded your model, which to me is a kind of transient regime. It means that you have not reached yet the maximal possible uh, dispersal ability in your in your uh, in your solution. So you, you start you initiate a solution with small values of d. You wait for some time, and if d max is very large, it varies some some regime uh, in which you haven't reached d max yet by evolution. So you can just put it at plus infinity and look what uh, what is going on. So this I will refer to that as a transient regime, and these are some uh, references for this uh, type of uh, of, of questions. Uh, uh, yesterday, I mentioned microbial evolution, and this is what I have this paper by uh, Defore and, uh, and others uh, that I have in mind. This is uh, their repeated uh, uh, experimental evolution where they, they have uh, identified some uh, hyper swarmers uh, associated with one mutation on the, on, the, on, the, on the flagella that give them some ability to disperse faster. And then they have some kind of, uh, some kind of uh, re inoculation experiment where they see that uh, it might uh, overwhelm the wild type if it's if it's inequality close to the to the edge of the of the population okay so i i will not comment further on that but this is what this is the reason was to uh, to to to, to um, illustrate what i uh, i had in mind okay so a few mathematical reasons to, uh, to, 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 uh, to draw the, the, the main picture. So if you are in the asymptotic regime, your D is bonded by some uh, value one and some value 10, let's say you have a, a one-fold uh, difference in, uh, in this personal ability. Uh, it does not depend on those values, of course. Uh, then essentially you get the same result as for Fisher KPP. You have a minimal speed, you have a front and it propagates. Uh, but what you, you have in, in, in addition is you have a phenotypic structure, of course, it's part of your equation, and you can, uh, you can uh, compute what it is. And I will give you, I, I will give more details in the next slide, but this is what you get. Your new in that, and that is that uh, your solution for the linear problem, again, is a linear equation which is environment by translation in space, so it must be an exponential in space, the same. And with a separation of variable, you have some uh, phenotypic distribution 
which is a probability distribution in the D variable. So it gives you uh, the distribution of individuals with respect to their dispersal ability. And this F is related, of course, to, uh, to lambda and to C. And I will give you some details. And this, in this F, this is where you see uh, clearly a spatial sorting. Uh, at least I'll try to convince uh, you that you, 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 you can measure it on F. Uh, okay, and then the second point is a transient regime when there is uh, not uh, any uh, a priori bound on D. So in this case, of course, you can see that uh, the, by evolution and spatial sorting, the, uh, the disperser will be more and more abundant at the edge. And by, uh, by evolution and slight uh, accumulated variation, by accumulation of slight variation, there will uh, be more and more uh, uh, dispersive. And so there is kind of rate of acceleration. And this can be explicitly uh, computed, which is a t to the 1.5 for this model. So this is a model dependent. Uh, okay, but this is close to some uh, value that I, uh, I took in the literature for the, for the Kintos. It does not mean that, uh, of course, it's a, it's a correct mechanism. There are it's much, it's very, very minimal uh, model, but it tells you that at least it, it, it gives you something which, which is important is that it is a power loop here to me, something which is actually uh, in, the, in the data. Okay, so uh, I wanted to, uh, to to draw your attention on this f. So again, if I say that f of t x and d is some uh, exponential in space times uh, a distribution f of d, and if I plug this into my problem, what I will have, I will have lambda c, which comes from the time derivative. I will get d lambda square, which comes from the uh, diffusion in space, plus r. And then I will have, uh, sorry, this is with uh, lambda c times f. Okay, uh, oops, sorry for that. This is times f. This is times f. This is times f. And then I have r times f uh, sigma square times f second here. So two derivatives because um, in my model, uh, I have uh, the variation are in the d direction. So when I put my ansatz, I have two derivatives in f. Okay, and this is with uh, no flux boundary condition. This is only for the bonded case, of course, because you, you expect a mini uh, speed of propagation. If it's unbonded, as I said, it's from the origin, there is some acceleration. So when you have a wave, uh, this is how you compute it. And this is a kind of spectral problem. You see it's a linear respect to f. It's a spectral problem, which is uh, elliptic, which can be solved actually with every functions. It's almost uh, explicit, but it doesn't really matter. I will, uh, I will skip that. And you see here that lambda c is a eigenvalue. And f is a eigenvector. So if you are able to solve this problem, and it has a unique, uh, a unique uh, solution with a positive f. If, if you can solve that, then you get c as a function of lambda, because of course lambda is in that. OK. And because when you get c as a function of lambda, you get the same uh, kind of picture. And you get a minimal speed here, which is not explicit, unfortunately. And this is quite tricky, actually, to, uh, to get. Uh, but anyway, it is very similar qualitatively as in Fisher KPP. What is more interesting to me is what is F? F, you see, so that, and the most important point to me, so F is a, now is a, is a function of D. And when you look where is D, so there is no D here, there is no D there, nor there. The only D occurs here. And you see that it's associated with a lambda square. So what does it mean if you if you see D now as a, as a as a trait? If you forget about the fact that it's a dispersal evolution, you just look at that. It tells you in some sense that the reproduction rate R comes with uh, D lambda square. So it's a kind of advantage. I would not call it a selective. I would call it a selective advantage, not a reproduction advantage. Uh, which comes with the fact that there is a lambda. And the fact that there is a lambda is due to the fact that there is a front. Actually, because there is a front, there is an exponential decay, there is a lambda. And because there is a lambda, there is actually a sort of advantage to have a large D. 
So from that, it's very uh, clear, very easy to see that if you look at f in the d variable now, so if you look at the phenotypic distribution at the edge, this is only at the edge because you are in the exponential uh, part, you see that uh, you can immediately prove that uh, d is uh, that f is increasing, of course, in d, and when sigma is very small, it will concentrate to the largest values of d. Okay, so this is a, this is a, what I would call the special sorting, and which exactly results from the fact that you have a you have a front with some uh, special decay, some kind of uh, heterogeneous uh, flux of uh, individuals. Uh, I mean, non-equilibrium flux of individuals. And this, this translates into the problem as a kind of selective uh, advantage. So yet it's not completely uh, clear how to deal. So you, you, might, uh, you might want to, uh, to uh, there is a, a, a simple thing to do, which is to average. So if you average in D, What you get, if you look at your, your equation, you average this equation in D. What you will get is that you have lambda C times one because F is a probability density, which will be lambda square, the mean value of D plus R. And the last one, if you look at it, sorry, the last one is zero because it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a derivative and there is no flex boundary condition. So the last one integrates to zero. So you get, you recover exactly KPP. You get that C of lambda is uh, lambda uh, d plus r divided by lambda. The point is that this itself is a function of lambda because it depends on the shape of f and the shape of f depends on lambda. So this is not a useful formula to make computation, but it gives you some, uh, some, uh, some natural insight and tells you that the speed, the minimal speed, what it is, will uh, propagate as the minimal speed of KPP with the correct uh, diffusion coefficient uh, average, but itself uh, depends on the on the lambda. This is the f of lambda. Okay, so this is a, a way to uh, to see at least a special sorting in the in the PD. And then I wanted to mention the two last uh, points. The first one is that uh, you can be a bit more precise about the rate of acceleration when you're in the transient region. And for the mathematician, there is some kind of interesting point is that uh, unlike the Fisher equation, Fisher KPP equation, uh, this, uh, the constant in front of the t to the 1.5 is not determined by the linear problem. So completion plays a role in the rate of acceleration. And you sit on the constant and not at the rate uh, as, uh, itself. And uh, the way you see it is uh, by numbers. If you look at the linear problem, so if you ignore competition and you look at the propagation of the level line, so the front is located around four third t to the three half, which is a uh, 1.33 uh, or so. Uh, but if you do some careful uh, non-linear analysis in 2D competition, you see that there is some uh, impeding effect. Competition slows down the acceleration and the true value is something like 1.31. So it's very close, 1.33. Uh, and it's a very weak result, but yet there is some kind of uh, competitive effect in the in the in the acceleration, which was not uh, expected because uh, again uh, you, it's a spatial sorting, you expect uh, the edge of the front to, uh, to carry all the dynamics, but it's not the case. So long thing I wanted to uh, to comment and it will be my last, uh, my last uh, message, is that uh, in some cases, and I hope it, uh, you, you can do more, but in, in, there is another case where uh, it's possible to compute the rate of expansion. Uh, and the point is to see how it, it depends on the mode of reproduction. So if you replace uh, a kind of clonal reproduction plus with slight variation, as in my, uh, in my uh, previous uh, model, PD model, and you suppose now that the trait is inherited from two parents. And uh, uh, it's not as a, in the talk of yesterday, here we, uh, we, we opted for the Fisher infinitesimal model, which is to say, which is related to, to, the, to models where you have a large number of loci with a very small additive effects. And then you mix the two by taking at random one of the, of the alleles of the, of the parent. And if you have a very large number, then you expect the trait of the offspring so this is a parental uh, trait. Let's say theta one and uh, theta one and theta two, and this is our spring. By some kind of central limit theorem, you expect that to uh, to 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 draw the mean value of the parental trait 
plus some uh, random normal uh, distribution with some variance, uh, which is called a segreg segregational variance or variance at the linkage uh, equilibrium. Anyway, in, if, you, if, you, if you opt for this uh, uh, mechanism of inheritance, let's say, then uh, you still observe rate of, uh, you still observe acceleration, but with a different rate. So the details are not very important to me at the, at the moment, but uh, the fact is that it's possible to do some kind of, uh, let's say, explicit computation up to a point, and there is even a conjecture for the, for the, for the constant in front of that. So you really, you really can are able to understand, let's say, the, the echo evolutionary dynamics, because of course, to understand the front propagation, you have to understand the phenotypical uh, dynamics. It's uh, all coupled, as I, I said in my previous uh, case. Uh, and the, the important point, and this will be my last comment, is that the reason for the, the main reason to me for the discrepancy between the five fourth and the three third, uh, the three half, sorry, in fact, that this is not a 1.5, but a 1.25, is due to the fact that in this particular uh, mechanism of inheritance, uh, there is no much room for the phenotypic variance to evolve. So in this case, you, you can see that the phenotypic variance is very much constrained by this uh, sigma square here, indeed. So uh, it's not possible, there is no much room. And the, the fact is that you, because you inherit only from half of your parents, if you have some disperser, some outlier at the front, they will very much likely lose part of their advantage, of their dispersal advantage. And, uh, and then you will, uh, you will, uh, you will have a, a slow uh, rate of expansion. Anyway, the details again are not that important. The point is that it's possible to do some kind of asymptotics up to uh, some, uh, some point when you are able to, uh, to, uh, to understand the, 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 the eco ecological and evolutionary uh, coupling. Okay, so thank you very much for your attention. And uh, I'm very uh, looking forward for, for, for a discussion. Thanks. Thank